Good evening. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Sterling, Surgeon General for Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. On behalf of our general president, Brother Dr. Willis Lanza III, we welcome you to tonight's webinar on managing diabetes. You should know that biological risk factors, including weight and fat around the abdomen, are primarily responsible for higher rates of diabetes for Black Americans when compared with white Americans. You're more likely to develop type 2 diabetes if you're 45 years or older, have a family history of diabetes, or are overweight or obese. According to the U.S. Office of Minority Health, in the United States, Black adults are about 60% as likely as whites to develop, excuse me, 60% more likely as whites to develop type 2 diabetes and twice as likely to die from it. The disparity has actually been rising over the last 30 years. As such, reducing your risk can be as simple as losing that excess weight, and that's what we'll discuss tonight. Let's spend the run up to the holiday season finding more constructive conversations and dialogues to share with our family. Let's discuss practical and attainable health solutions. We welcome back as tonight's moderator, Alpha Falfers, Deputy Surgeon General for Family Health. Brother Dr. Victor Narcisse the third is a spring 1990 initiate of the Rho Iota chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha and is currently active in Alpha Eta Lambda chapter. He practices at the Houston Methodist Hospital as the Associate Division Head of Hospital Medicine and is the, the Director of Clinical Research in the Division of Hospital Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine and he is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the Society of Hospital Medicine. Welcome brother Dr. Narcisse. Have a great show. Looking forward to it. Good evening. Thanks for being here. I'd like to uh, recognize that today is Veterans Day and we'd like to thank all those who uh, currently serve or who have served in the past. I'd also like to thank today um, uh, to the dais, uh, Dr. Robert Dansby. Dr. Dansby has uh, substantial business uh, executive expertise and his current interests are in implementing innovative healthcare delivery solutions that utilize health information technology, telehealth, clinical decision support tools, and online education and training. These are the types of activities that have been so important for my practice uh, over the, the last several years. And I think that he brings a, a unique perspective to the discussion of healthcare and diabetes especially. His, uh, his educational background uh, is in PH, is a PhD in economics, and I think that it allows for a unique perspective. Uh, I'd like to, to bring Brother Dansby to the dais. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Uh, Brother Dansby, uh, again, looking at it from the the macro level, can you tell us a little bit about how big a problem diabetes is from your, your end? Yes, diabetes is a major problem. It's a global epidemic. As Dr. Sterling was indicating, it's a growing problem, has been for the last decade or so, and is accelerating in its impact on various populations. Currently, there are about 88 million adults above age 18 that have prediabetes. And of these, about 40 million are men and about 11 million are African-Americans. So uh, the percentage of African-Americans that have prediabetes is significantly above that of the general population. Uh, there are about 34% of U.S. adults that have prediabetes uh, based on fasting glucose and other statistics of this nature give an indication of the extent of this problem. There are a higher percentage of men that have uh, prediabetes, and if we look at diabetes on a global basis, we see that more than 700 million people have diabetes. And in the U.S., there are about 34 million 
uh, diabetic patients that represent about 10% of the population uh, with about a million and a half new cases each year. And in the African-American community, there are about 4.9 million people that are affected or about 18% of the population, again, higher than the uh, population averages. So it's a major problem. Pre-diabetes and diabetes together account for about 122 million cases in the U.S. And this is something that you can speak to. Yes, uh, it's just staggering. We're spending a, a tremendous amount of our um, our time and our health care uh, dollars in providing care for individuals who have diabetes. Uh, and I, one of the things I'd like to talk a little bit more about tonight is um, ways to prevent the diabetes from um, from developing in your in your health uh, history. And if you do develop diabetes, how to prevent it from from progressing. What would you say are the types of diabetes? You know, the, there are several different types. Um, some individuals have diabetes that's uh, as a result of their family history of their genetics. Um, these persons have what we call type one diabetes. And the diff what, what happens in their bodies is that they're not making enough insulin in the, the pancreas organs. I think that those individuals have uh, an opportunity to become diagnosed at a fairly early time point. Uh, many more children are historically type, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But what we're starting to see is more and more people are developing type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is because the insulin that you already make is sufficient in quantity but it doesn't work as well because uh, the, your body just doesn't uh, see the, the insulin as effectively. And this is a unique target that I'm very, very interested in um, because I, I believe that with appropriate nutrition and with increased activity, we can uh, reduce the, the number of persons who develop type two diabetes and also uh, lessen the impact when people do develop type 2 diabetes. And this is a, a personal uh, story uh, in my life. Uh, my mother, my grandmother, um, several other members of my family have been diagnosed with diabetes. And I see that the types of things that we have done in, historically in my community, um, as many of you uh, know, I'm from New Orleans. Um, I grew up in a very, very tight knit family. Uh, everyone cooked, but the kinds of things we cooked were not necessarily the types of things that we recommend that we're going to, that you should cook. So we'll, we'll talk more, more about that over the, the, the next, um, the next bit. What, was, what should we know about diabetes for ourselves and our families, especially as we enter the holidays? So uh, I mentioned that there are some genetic predispositions for diabetes. Some people are more likely to get it because their, their, their parents had it, their grandparents had it. And so that's one of the things that you should know when you, when you sit around the table uh, over the, this holiday season, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, and, and so forth, um, you should actually have a very, very frank conversation with your family members to understand what their risks are. Uh, what, you, what your risks are based on what their health conditions have been. Uh, in many families, there's an unwillingness to discuss challenges, difficulties, diagnoses, problems, and it's because uh, many people don't want to don't want to focus on negatives. They don't want to speak to uh, problems. But what I believe is that there's an opportunity that if my children understand that they are at higher risk because of something that I have, they may need to take additional steps and additional actions to prevent them from developing 
um, heart disease, kidney disease, circulation disease, blindness, and so forth. So again, it, you should be asking um, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles about the, uh, their health history. Do you have diabetes? Do you have heart disease? Do you have kidney disease? Do you have circulation problems? Has anyone had blindness in our family? Uh, in addition to other things like cancer risk. So I think that that's a, a useful thing to know. And I think that that will help you shape your own individual health plan uh, for your future. And I think that that's a, a thing that we have not uh, done a very, very good job of. Additionally, there is a, another component that I sometimes forget that uh, my, my parents learned from my grandparents how to cook. We adopt the exercise habits of those who are around us. And so it, everyone knows that the best food in the world is in New Orleans. There's no question about this. However, not all of the food choices that are made by uh, individuals who grew up in New Orleans are necessarily good for us. And so some of the things that we have, have been taught to do um, every Friday growing up in my household, we would have fried fish. That's not a good idea. And so families uh, cluster around their health issues in part because of their genetics, but also because they're exposed to the same potentially damaging health habits. So what are the symptoms that we should look for? You know, in diabetes, I think that there are some very, very simple things. And I think that uh, we should all be very, very aware that a person who's all of a sudden very, very hungry, very, very thirsty, urinating a lot, um, these are not normal things. And they, might be, they may be signs that your, your blood sugar is high. Those things can cause your mouth to become dry, um, blurred vision. Uh, some individuals may have very, very frequent infections, whether they they are on the skin, uh, areas that stay moist can can get uh, redness and uh, yeast infections. Uh, individuals who have high blood sugar are more prone to getting infections in their uh, their urine, infections, um, particularly of the the lower extremities, the skin and the, the on your feet and on your legs. These are things to watch out for. So redness, particularly if this happens over and over and over again, it may be a sign that there's something that that is is happening that's going to be a problem. How, we often how, will see that um, if, if a person who has diabetes develops an, a, a, a wound on their leg or on their arms, they may heal very, very slowly. And so this is something that we watch out for. And in fact, we educate patients who have diabetes to be wary of, of uh, having rocks or sharp objects that might fall into their shoes because having diabetes for long periods of time can, can cause numbness in your, your feet and your legs. And the, the, uh, the classic, the classic finding is someone who has a rock in their shoe doesn't know that they have a rock in their shoe and the rock can be in their shoe for uh, long periods of time, not just uh, minutes, but maybe hours, not just hours, but days. And they can develop uh, 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 abrasions or, or cuts on their, their feet. And unfortunately, those might not, not heal very well. Uh, again, a person who's uh, diabetes is newly diagnosed or they have the type 1 diabetes, they may have nausea, vomiting, uh, they could have weight loss, they can have a, a belly pain. So there's a whole host of things. So uh, one of the things we often encourage in uh, my branch of internal medicine, in geriatric medicine and hospital medicine is that everyone should have a health provider that they are very comfortable with. And uh, whether that's a, a doctor in a clinic like my own in internal medicine or in family medicine, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, someone that they can feel very comfortable picking up the phone, calling with problems and stopping in and, and seeing someone in, in their office before problems develop uh, to a greater extent where you need to go to an emergency room or to urgent care. How do you diagnose diabetes? 
So diabetes is actually very easy to diagnose. It's done in the office. It can be done in just moments. And what we typically will do is a blood test. Uh, the, the newest blood test will measure your blood sugar over the last three months and kind of get an average. And that'll give us a sense of whether your blood sugar has been very, very high, very, very low, uh, if you're having other problems. But there are urine tests that can be quite helpful. There can actually even be um, a, a finger prick test that a, a doctor or a nurse can do in the office. And we actually encourage patients who are ultimately diagnosed with diabetes to pay very, very close attention to their blood sugar levels. And one of the traditional ways of doing that is to prick your finger with a, a, a tiny, tiny, uh, sharp, but sterile and clean and sterile um, object. And then uh, put a, a several drops of blood on a, on a, a, on a small uh, strip. And then that get, gets put into a machine that does a, a chemical analysis and can tell how much blood sugar is there. So that's a, a thing that that uh, can be done in the screening fashion, but also is used to monitor how effectively diabetes is being managed on a day to day, week to week, month to month uh, uh, basis. I'll ask a related question. Um, we often have fraternity members, chapter brothers that are dealing with sicknesses such as diabetes. As friend and family, how can we play a role in helping them to identify when they are having or likely to have problems? So my parents were, were educators, and so I, I long have uh, believed that education is the key. And so just stopping and learning a, 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 the, the things that we're talking about tonight can be quite helpful. Uh, but the, your family members need something more than just knowledge. They need your support and they need your presence. And uh, what I find a lot of individuals tell me is that they're uncomfortable going to see a healthcare professional because they're afraid of being told bad things. And uh, that, it's kind of like uh, when, my, when my son doesn't want to go to school to take the test, because he's afraid that the test is going to turn out badly. So he wants to stay home and not take the test. Unfortunately, that uh, for my son and for uh, for other individuals, that just doesn't work. Uh, one armed with the information of whatever is going on in your health history, I think that you can help make appropriate health decisions. And almost never am I telling a patient a health diagnosis that doesn't have some options for at least consideration. So uh, in the case of diabetes, it is a lifelong process. Patients are not cured of diabetes, but you can control the risk factors very effectively. And even if a, a doctor or a, a health professional is offering or suggesting that you require medication treatments for diabetes, it doesn't mean that, but that you can't eliminate the need for medications by appropriate health activities. And so we actually will uh, start the conversation uh, with someone when we're worried that they might have diabetes uh, or they have risk factors for diabetes. Uh, we might ask them to, uh, instead of just taking this medication, let's talk about lifestyle modification that you can do. So the things that we worry about for uh, increasing your risk for diabetes is uh, when your weight's too high. Uh, obesity is a national epidemic. I think everyone has talked about that many, many times in your, in your families, in your friends, in your communities, but uh, we, we struggle with it. I think we all struggle with, with weight. Uh, our act, we don't have enough activity. We don't eat the right foods and it becomes a, a problem and it's becoming a problem with our children. So I, I hope that we can all make a, a, a subtle but definitive adjustment in our lifestyles. Other things that will increase your risk for having diabetes, as we mentioned before, would be having a parent, a grandparent, a sibling with diabetes. In terms of physical activity we, for, for goals, we talk about uh, activity a lot. We talk about exercise a lot, but what does that mean? It just starts with 
exercising three times a week. That's all we ask people to do to start. Now we have a goal that's much greater. We'll talk more about that later this, this evening, but we start with just move 15 minutes, three times a week. Everyone can do that in your workplace. If you get up, if you work at a computer, if you get up and move several times a day, that's something that can be quite helpful. And unfortunately for patients who, or persons who look like myself, if you have African-American, Hispanic American, Native American ancestry, then you are at, at higher risk for diabetes. Um, again, a combination of genetics and activity and diet has led all of these communities to be at higher risk. And uh, rather than disparaging and, and, and becoming um, despondent about that, I think that it, it, it provides an, an opening and an opportunity because if you have the, the health backgrounds of those communities, then you need to take more action. You need to do that now. Uh, there are other people who are at risk for diabetes who have had pancreas disease, uh, fatty liver disease, uh, certain kinds of cancers, certain individuals that we give certain medications to, particularly steroids, uh, back problem is, uh, uh, back disease is a, is a common problem in the United States. Uh, and steroids are a frequent uh, intervention for that. Steroids are given for lots of, of autoimmune problems. And so if you're taking these kinds of medicines, then you're at higher risk for diabetes. Again, not something to be afraid of, not to, something to be ashamed of, but something to take proactively and do something about. You know, I, I think there are a lot of prevention programs out there. Um, the CDC has a, a, a really nice one. Brother Dansby, can you speak to that? Yes, um, the Center for Disease Control conducted a series of clinical studies over the last 20 years or so in which they looked at various intervention methodologies that could reduce the risk of diabetes. And they developed a program called the Diabetes Prevention Program that has been implemented in a number of different community and programs, online versions of the prevention program exist. And these programs have been shown to be highly effective in reducing the risk of full-blown diabetes uh, for di uh, pre-diabetic patients. And in fact, uh, for the study groups, 58% of the people who took part in the diabetes prevention program uh, had reduced risk of getting uh, diabetes. And the prevention program really focuses on several of the areas of risk factors that you mentioned, uh, ones that are uh, under our control and influenced by our lifestyle. So the exercise, the diet are key components of the uh, prevention program. The prevention program includes a series of uh, courses that can be delivered in community settings or online. Uh, it includes life coaches that are part of the implementation of the program, and it includes support groups, something that Dr. Narcisse mentioned as well. Uh, the program is designed to occur over a six month period initially with once per week meetings. Uh, and after the first six months, meetings of once per month uh, for participants is recommended. Many of the participants continue to follow the regiments of the program even after the one year period is completed. And I think that shifting the lifestyle of the participants is the main objective of the program. Shifting life, lifestyle with regards to especially exercise and diet. 
And you may want to say some more specific words with regards to nutrition and diet factors that make a difference with regards to reducing diabetic risk. Doctor? Yes, thank you so much. I, I think that that's exactly right. I think that nutrition is is one of the key places. And I, I'll tell you, it's the place that I am, I continue to struggle with the most in my own healthcare journey. Again, I start with the, the best food in the world and uh, it becomes challenging to adopt practices and habits that are different than the ones that, that my mother taught me, that my grandmother taught me. And particularly over the holidays where I'm, I'm looking for gumbo, I'm looking for um, uh, the holiday meals, such a big part of the shared culture that we have. So I ask the questions of myself and of other people, of, uh, uh, you know, what effect does the influence of your family, your friends, your coworkers have on, you, on your eating? Are there opportunities that you can uh, undertake? And so in the case of my family, if we're all trying to adopt a healthier diet, uh, a healthier nutrition um, standpoint, then uh, instead of having my mom make the, the that, that food that I love so much growing up <laughs> that may not necessarily always be so good for me, there maybe there's some other choices that could be made. You know, I, I think that one of those is the switch from processed foods to unprocessed foods. Um, patients come to me all the time and they ask me about plant-based diets. And while I, I don't I don't have a plant-based diet myself, um, if you're moving in that direction, the idea of more vegetables, um, foods that are that are higher in uh, uh, meals that are higher in fruits, beans for your protein, whole grains, lean meats, um, so not red meats, uh, fish, chicken uh, is really the way to go. If you're looking for more protein, uh, nut seeds are the kinds of things that that really that really work. Um, in terms of drinks, uh, I, I grew up with all of the, the 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 favorite drinks from the vending machine that everyone else had. Um, I used to look forward to having those at lunch, sometimes at lunch and dinner, sometimes lunch, dinner, and snacks, and that's just not a, a good choice for me and, and my life. And so I I really try to switch from uh, you know sugary drinks to um, to more water uh, we really uh, emphasize the the water and I, I encourage all of my colleagues my coworkers, to have you know a, a, a water bottle with them at work uh, I have I know how how much water is in my bottle and to get to 64 ounces in the day how many times I have to fill it up and once you start paying attention to and tracking what you're trying to do, then all of a sudden one becomes quite um, aware of how, uh, how far away our usual practices are. I think before I started tracking my water intake, I was drinking uh, less than 20 ounces of water in a day. And again, the goal is 64. So I think that those are the kinds of things that we, we need to do. There are other, there are other uh, changes that we need to make. Um, sodium is one of them. Uh, salt is, in, is a standard part of diet. It's been that way for uh, a millennia. Uh, salt has been used from uh, times of the, the Romans and the Vikings to, um, to preserve food. The challenge is that in our modern day, where we're eating out of the freezer more, eating out of boxes, eating out of cans more, we're taking in larger and larger and larger quantities of sodium. Uh, so now, instead of the goal of 2,000, 2,500 milligrams of sodium in a day, I see patients who are, who are taking in four, five, 10 grams a day, and uh, that has a, a, a horrible effect on their their um, their diet on their heart and causes trouble that will ultimately lead to having more difficulties with with their health and diabetes is uh, you know just part of that. So we talked about yes. 
Would ahead. you say that um, BMI is a good indicator that each of us can use to track our risk? You know, I, I think tracking becomes such a, a an integral part of what we, we do. Um, and uh, it, it's often said you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, uh, I think it's Stephen Covey. And I think that it's whether you you just pull out a sheet of paper or whether you have a fancy tracking app on your phone, I think that it's, it's quite um, quite beneficial to pay close attention. Um, my my phone has a uh, an area where it will track my steps and I can actually pay close attention to that. And once I started paying attention to it, I realized that uh, I wasn't hitting the 7,000 steps a day that I that I really need. And I certainly wasn't hitting the 10,000 steps a day that I aspired to. And that to get to those goals, I really needed to do something extra. I mentioned about water um, and tracking that. Um, tracking weight is a, a, a thing that maybe not every, everyone wants to do, but I think it's something that we all should pay close attention to. And I didn't realize uh, where my where my health had gone until I started weighing myself more regularly. And then all of a sudden I, I realized that those numbers aren't exactly the goals that I had in mind. And so I needed to do something else. So I've, I've continued to change, to change um, my, my diet. Um, again, uh, the fats is something that uh, that's in the food. Um, the, the types of food that I grew up eating was heavy in fat. And so, um, instead of butter, margarine, instead of margarine, um, using uh, healthier oils like olive oil is the, the general trajectory. But there are also lots of traps. I, I work in a hospital uh, that, where there are vending machines because uh, individuals in the, in the hospital have irregular eating times and 24-hour uh, experiences. Well, uh, we've actually gone to the hospital and said, hey, can we get healthier snack options in the vending machine so that not everything is a is a bag of chips that is problematic? Are there more opportunities to have more things that are baked? But um, and I'm not when I say baked, I don't I don't mean uh, baked as in cupcakes. I mean, baked as in uh, foods that are prepared with less fat. So those are the kinds of uh, uh, an evolution that we can have. And we can have that same conversation in our community. So when we're talking to our loved ones about what we should, what we should eat and what we should cook, we should have a very frank conversation about, you know, where are we going out to eat? What are we? What, what type of recipe are, are we planning to follow? Are we going to do something because it's easy? I, I, I get home late, and when it's late, I don't, I don't feel like cooking, and because I don't feel like cooking, uh, then I. I I, I look for something that's quick and, and something that's quick is rarely the, the best food choice. So are, is there an opportunity to, to develop a food plan that incorporates the, the change from processed foods to unprocessed foods that pays attention to our sodium, looks at uh, fiber. Fiber is a thing that, that I, I, we all need to, to eat much more of. And uh, the, uh, the, the dietitians that I work with will tell us to fill about half of your plate with vegetables, half of it. And if, you, if you're having trouble tracking that or envisioning that, one of the things that, that we actually recommend to, to folks around here is to take a picture. Everyone's got a cell phone these days and everyone takes lots of selfies. Instead of taking pictures of your food to show off to your friends, take a picture of your food so that you can have some accountability. So you can look at it and say, where are my vegetables? Uh, am I uh, having uh, whole grains or white rice? Am I having beans and lentil or am I having red meat? If I'm having salad, uh, one of the things that we see people do here often is they'll, they'll have salad and they feel very good about the salad. But then on top of the salad, they add bacon and salad dressing, um, um, uh, a whole host of of embellishments that really make that salad taste uh, spectacular. But if you're not careful, you'll end up with a salad that has more calories than something that comes from a fast food restaurant. 
uh, more fat than something that comes from a fast food restaurant. I, I loved fast food restaurants growing up. Uh, I very much in, um, look forward to stopping there on the way home after um, uh, after school, after doing something that uh, that I was particularly proud of, and I could be rewarded as a snack. Using unhealthy food as a as a reward is is a, a, tr a psychological trap that encourages us to look forward to eating unhealthy foods. And so this is something that we need to, to work on in our families during the holidays for our, our children to not, not teach them to e eat in an unhealthy way. And again, yes. that, that, that requires that we have to do the work of, of preparing the food, of switching meats to fish, butter to oil, uh, cheese to avocado, fried, oh, I love my fried food, but fried food to something that's roasted or baked or air fried. Uh, you know, air fryer is a, a wonderful, a, a wonderful uh, tip uh, that, that's come to, uh, to many kitchens around where I am. Yes, doctor, we have a question from the audience. Yes. Can the MIND diet help, the M-I-N-D diet? Well, um, there, there are a lot of different diets. And um, uh, I, I, the first diet I can remember hearing was the grapefruit diet. And we've, uh, we've gone through a series of them, the Mediterranean diets. Uh, uh, everyone's talking about plant-based diets. There's a, there's a whole host of them. And I think that um, rather than thinking about a diet, what I encourage people to do is to talk amongst your family members and change the way that change your relationship with food. Again, if you use food as a reward, then when you're looking for a reward, you're going to be looking for food. And then particularly if you use certain kinds of food as a reward, then you're going to be looking for those especially. And so I think that um, instead of speaking about a, a diet per se and going on a diet, I remember a number of, uh, of attempts in my household and my family, extended family members, amongst my friends, um, they would go on a diet. They would maybe even have a lot of success, losing a great deal of weight. But they changed um, they they changed the, what they were eating without changing their relationship with food. And as a result, um, it wasn't something that they could maintain for long periods of time. And so they would end up reverting to their their default diets. And again, that's very easy to do in New Orleans. And then they would end up at, at a, a weight point that was actually higher than they were before. Um, the, the common thing that we, we, we hear in the, amongst our, our patients is, I wish I was as fat as I was the first time I thought I was fat. <laughs> I wish I was as fat as I was I, the first time I thought I was fat meaning that they thought that they were fat before, but they continued to have healthy, unhealthy activities and they continue to gain weight. They continue to um, not engage in healthy activities and that their weight continues to rise, continues to rise, continues to rise. And all of a sudden um, they've gone from someone who was um, in a, very, very healthy to someone who uh, was didn't look bad, but had a, a, some extra extra weight to someone whose health is being uh, very, very obviously damaged because of all the excess weight. And um, uh, it's not uncommon for us to see uh, individuals who can't move, who physically can't walk anymore uh, because of the, the, the complications of their weight, their diabetes, their heart disease. And so these are the kinds of things that we wish to avoid. I, I think that, you know, that there are People get confused and think that, that that getting a diagnosis is a death sentence. Diabetes is not. If you get diabetes because you're a type one and you have um, a, a genetic profile that you couldn't avoid, or type two and you have these unhealthy lifestyles that have been given to us that we've adopted that we continue to perpetuate, um, that that the world has ended. I, I now have to take medicines. I have to take shots. Well. Whether there there are oral medicines, every every time I look up, there's a new oral medicine for diabetes. It actually, as a physician, challenging to keep up because there are so many new treatment options, and these treatment options work. They work for your blood sugar. They work for your diabetes. 
but uh, the insulin that we grew up with, you know, that works as well. Um, insulin is inconvenient, uh, it requires shots, sometimes more than one shot a day, but there are a number of, of newer techniques, there are newer technologies that become available. Um, insulin pump is one that, that uh, a number of my patients uh, have adopted because they can achieve a very, very um, careful control of their diabetes, their blood sugar, and maintain their lifestyle. They don't have to carry around um, uh, the insulin needles uh, the way that they would have in the past. And it's a self-contained uh, thing. So there are uh, things that you can do even if you develop a, a, a diagnosis. But the thing that always works best is not developing the diagnosis, not developing diabetes. And that is, at least in part, up to us. Can we adopt better cooking habits, better activity habits? Um, you know, we uh, look at this in a, great, uh, in a great deal. Houston has more restaurants per capita than any other uh, city in the, the country. Uh, and pre-pandemic, we consider that a point of pride. Uh, you could go to a different restaurant, a different um, a, a different genre of food every single day and not have to go back to the first one for quite some time. And so eating out at, uh, at work for lunch, eating out at, at after, after work for dinner was something that we enjoyed doing. And we still can do that. But when you're eating out, you have to be very, very cautious about your food choices because the majority of restaurants um, prepare foods in a way that's different than what your optimum might be. And increasingly now you have to have calorie information, indications of what's healthy, what's not. Do pay attention to that. Um, there isn't a, a cooking label next to every, every uh, item on a restaurant menu, but you can get a sense of, hey, if I'm gonna eat that fried, fried fish, fried catfish, fried, uh, crab, fried crawfish. I'm, 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 I'm getting hungry just thinking about all this stuff. Um, I, you see, I'm still working on my relationship with food. Um, but while you're doing all that, you need to uh, look at, hey, are there other choices? Could you have those same foods, but instead of fried, could you have it uh, uh, broiled or grilled? And that's something you can do. The other thing that happens in uh, the Houston uh, market where I am, and I'm sure it's happening everywhere in the United States, is that the food portions are getting greater and greater and greater. Now, I remember being able to go to, go to a restaurant, Brother Dansby, I, I suspect you've had similar experiences. You go to a restaurant, you eat your food, and you, that would be the end of it. Now you go eat to a restaurant, eat your food, you're full, and there's still another meal on the, on the plate. Yes, Right. So everyone has everyone has supersized their their menus in the attempt to try to get your business, and instead of demanding from our restaurants and our restaurant tours a larger portion size, well, we need to continue to ask of ourselves and those who prepare food for us: Can you prepare food that's better for me? Uh, and, and I think that that's 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 a key thing. And so yes. it, it may be. Uh, I don't know, Brother Dansby, if you're able to do it. I'm still struggling in trying to to do food food preparation and prepare a whole week's worth of food, um, or a, a part of a week's worth of food at, at a single setting. But many of my friends have had a great deal of success with this. Many of my patients have had a great deal of success, particularly when you're trying to work, you're busy. You've got lots of things to do. And when you come home, you just don't have time to sit and look for a recipe, start pulling out food out of the cabinet or out of the refrigerator, and then now start cooking. Yes, you asked me a question. And my response is that, yes, I practice that. I practice what you preach. I have a two-gallon uh, pot that I make uh, various dishes in, healthy and I freeze what I don't eat at the first setting. And then I have it available uh, for months at a time because it's there in the freezer. We have a couple of questions from the audience. In terms of BMI range, 
what should be our goal? Sure. Um, we see patients that have uh, BMIs over 30 or over uh, as having a problem, but even 24 is, is something that we're we're really trying to, to to look at as a as as a number that we can can strive for. That BMI is a, a careful relationship between height and weight. But b- before you start thinking about your BMI and putting it into a calculator, what I encourage people to do is to to look at your look at your closet and look at are you changing clothes because you're changing size and the numbers on your sizes are, are going up and up and up. Uh, if that's the case, then, then you have an opportunity. Uh, and your opportunity is that if you can reverse that trend and, and get closer to the weight you, you were when you were in college, that's a place that you could strive for. Some people say to shoot for the weight that you were in high school, I don't think that I'm ever going to get back there, but <laughs> I, I think that getting close to the, the the levels that I was when I was leaving college, I think is an attainable goal. And I think that for many people, that's a, a place to be. But uh, again, um, what you're looking for is the, a healthy lifestyle, not just the number. The number is, is sort of a, a, a an intermediate measure of where you are and how you're doing. Ultimately, the number doesn't say you're having a heart attack, you're having diabetes. It just means that if your numbers are better, you're less likely to get into trouble. So I think that that's, that's a useful thing. So, so right. me, you, you've made your home a healthy place, it sounds like, in terms of your cooking and your preparation. Um, what are the, the kinds of things that have you've adopted that has allowed that to happen? I, I, I struggle with that still. Right. Uh, You were talking earlier about some of the things that are helpful. For example, I made the decision a few years ago, no more fried foods. I haven't kept that totally, (laughs) but every now and then I'll have uh, a a fried uh, fish. But generally speaking, avoiding fried foods is a practice that I follow. Another thing is to have a high fiber content in my diet. Oatmeal in the morning. Some of the foods that I prepare are vegetable centric. Uh, I make a okra and tomato onion dish uh, that is really great, tasty, spicy, and good for digestion. <laughs> Those are examples. Well, again, I'm still at work. And so I, I, finding the right foods to eat at work is is the key for me. And so I'm trying to, uh, we, we now have a fridge uh, that's nearby in my office where we can bring food from, from home. So if I can get to this food preparation stage, I can actually bring, bring food in and, and uh, uh, there's a microwave, you can heat it up so you, I can have better control over, over what I'm eating at home, at work. But also um, what types of snacks that I have over the course of my day, having nuts in, um, in controlled um, amounts is a, a, a thing to do. Um, I, I mentioned fruits, uh, apples, raisins are, are, are things that I, that I find very helpful. Um, carrots, celery um, in pre- contained portions and the pre-contained portions is a, is a big deal because what I um, historically uh, have have had trouble with because we've been supersizing uh, these portions is that I would eat and then I wouldn't give myself enough time uh, before I would start looking for more food. So yeah. from the time you put the food in your mouth until the time the food gets to your stomach and tells the rest of your body that you ate, that takes about 20 minutes. And so um, eating large quantities of food in one setting will be a recipe for overeating. And so uh, if instead of eating, uh, we grew up eating three large meals a day, I, I find that a lot of my patients have greater success if they eat five to six smaller 
meals over the course of the day. And again, the, the, the trick of not overeating in any one session is, is key. And so if you can make decisions about how much to eat at times that are separated from when you're eating, that's a key thing. And so when I eat all the food that I've prepared, I know that that's, the, that's my food budget. I've completed everything that I'm going to do and I, I need to move on. Right. We have a question with regards to the effect of weight loss on reducing A1C levels. So if you have diabetes and your blood sugar is elevated, uh, the a hemoglobin A1C is a reflection of your three month average blood sugar. If that is high, your blood sugar is poorly controlled. If you can increase your exercise, if you can change your diet, uh, if you can re reduce your weight, it does have a very, very strong positive effect on your hemoglobin A1C. That number, if you go to your, your doctor, you go to your healthcare professional, uh, a higher number is uh, more of a problem. The number you're looking for is less than 6, 6.5. Uh, it is a, a, a good goal for most people. But I, I saw 14 uh, a couple hours ago. Uh, I, I saw an 11 a couple of hours ago, uh, I'm sorry, this morning. So um, individuals in our communities have dramatically poorly controlled blood sugars. And again, because they don't, they haven't taken the time to educate themselves, to realize what's going on. They haven't taken the, taken the, the courage to go see a healthcare provider. Uh, even if they, they, they're told things that they don't want to, they don't, ideally want to hear, um, it, it's, it's a real problem. So I really encourage people, if your A1C, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol are elevated, if you can implement uh, a safe and healthy weight loss. And safe and healthy weight loss isn't going on a crash diet. It's changing your nutritional patterns over long periods of time. We really encourage people to do is lose only about a pound to two pounds in a week. It doesn't sound like very much to many people, particularly if you have very ambitious weight loss goals, as many of us do now, and more of us will will have after the holidays. But I think that if you can uh, uh, really work towards increasing your exercise, changing your your food habits, uh, it will reduce your weight. It will improve your your hemoglobin A one C. I, yes. I wanted to talk more, Brother Dansby, about exercise. Yes. Um, and um, it sounds like you've you've cracked the code in terms of of uh, your eating. Um, one of the things that I have had more success with is my uh, the exercise end of things. And I just started during COVID. Um, uh, before COVID, I was uh, eat, work, sleep, work, family and uh wash, rinse, repeat, uh, church once a week, but basically that was it. Uh, since COVID's come along, I recognize that I, I needed to do something fairly dramatic. This year I have a milestone um, birthday, and so I started cycling. Um, I cycled this past weekend, uh, uh, an event actually raising funds for the American Diabetes Association in part, and I, I was able to, to bike 50 miles. I, I don't think that I could have ever envisioned biking more than five miles before this. And so in a relatively short period of time, I have seen tremendous gains in my exercise activity. So we tell people, you know, 150 minutes a week is what you want to do, 30 minutes a day. That sounds very attainable until you don't have 30 minutes in your day because of, of life. And so we, we, we really encourage people to do is start with 10, 15 minutes. If you can, if you can take all the commercials that you did that you watched over the course of the day, instead of watching those commercials, you moved, you walked that same period of time. That's a great place to start. Right. Yeah. In terms of my exercise, I focus on swimming, and um, usually two, three times a week. That was a challenge during COVID when the Y that I go to was closed down. 
Uh, I just recently resumed swimming. But in the interim, what I did was to do uh, static exercises at home. Uh, there's a lot of exercises, sit-ups and those kinds of things that you can do at home with all, without all of the gym equipment, just yourself and your body and using your body weight for resistance. Uh, that works for me. So body resistance exercises is a great place for, for everyone to start. Um, again, even just walking is, a, is, is a, the entry point for, for so many people. And I think that that's a great place to, to begin. Um, again, one of the things that, that helps is that you're going to need the support of your family or friends uh, to find time to cook, to find time to exercise, and to support what you're doing. Um, and to not put you in places into situations where you're going to have um, challenges and temptations. Um, tracking results, um, we mentioned it in terms of weight, but also in terms of activity. And it could be as simple as a piece of paper to write down how, how long you walked, how far you walked. My cell phone tracks how many steps. Uh, as I've gotten into deeper and deeper into exercise, uh, uh, there are a plethora of running and exercise and cycling apps that will will pay attention to how far you you've gone and how far um you far away or you are from your goals but those are things that you can do that, that work so nicely a couple of more questions from the audience is turkey bacon an improvement over pork bacon we're looking for things that are sustainable and so if, if bacon is what you're looking for uh, Turkey bacon is certainly better than, than pork uh, in terms of the amount of fat, but it still will have a lot of, of sodium and it still has a lot of fat itself. So um, there are a number of food substitutes that you'll see in labels. And yes, that's better than the alternative. Um, a, a small hamburger is much better than the, the, the very, very large size one, but there still are opportunities to make even better food choices. And so I think that the, uh, those are things that we would like to um, to keep in mind. Perhaps a final question. Is there a recommended amount of water consumption per day? Yes, we're saying 64 ounces is, is the key. And uh, it's hard to remember that. Everyone talks about eight, eight ounce glasses. But uh, I don't know anybody who does a very good job of keeping track of their their glasses. And so what we really encourage people to do is to get um, a water bottle with a known amount, and it could be a 64 ounce one, or uh, this one is one that I have in my office, so it's, it's 24 ounces. And then I can track how many times I've filled it up. And it, it again, is, it's humbling to realize that uh, I, I thought that I was drinking a lot of water, but then when I actually put pen to paper, when I actually started uh, looking at how many times I filled this bottle, it, it wasn't meeting the mark. And so it gives you an opportunity uh, for to develop some accountability. Right. I, I would like to, um, to do a couple of things here. Um, again, thank all those who have served in the, the, the U.S. Uh, Armed Forces. It is Veterans Day. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brother President Lonzer, who has... Uh, helped us encourage this this health series, which is a, a new one for us. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Brother Surgeon General Jeffrey Sterling that, that gave us the introduction. He's the, the inspiration of this activity. I'd like to thank Dr. L uh, Dr. Dansby for, for spending so much of his time and sharing his experiences and his wisdom in this field. We'd like to thank the audience uh, we we couldn't do this without you. Uh, in the YouTube videos, they say like and subscribe. We're not doing that, but we are saying come back next week. Next week, we'll be talking about holiday travel in the age of COVID. I think it'll be enlightening. There will be information uh, that many of us uh, may have not thought of before, and everyone's going to want to travel and be around loved ones for the holidays. I think that would be helpful. Uh, given the hour, I will say good night. And, stay, and we'll offer our, our prayers for all those who need them. Good night.